Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Health Via Modern Nutrition Podcast, the HVMN Podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. And today, we're going to talk about our favorite demonized macronutrient food category. We're going to talk about carbohydrates and the forms of carbohydrates with an expert in the topic. We're really excited to have Dr. Richard Johnson on the program. Rick, great to have you on the program. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on. For folks who aren't attuned to your background, I like to start from the very early beginnings. I know you have a background in nephrology, looking at fructose and kind of your research areas, but wind us back to the young days of Richard. What brought you into medicine? Was there a seminal uh, mentor or, or family member that inspired you to go down that route? Well, uh, my original interest was in anthropology and archaeology, but my father was an academic physician, and he always tried to encourage me to think about medicine as a field. And uh, when I was in college, I you know, decided I'd go to medical school. Following my education and training, I trained in Seattle at the University of Washington for my residency in internal medicine. I ended up deciding to go into the field of nephrology although I also boarded an infectious disease. Nephrology is the study of kidney disease. It's pretty far from the area of metabolism that I'm now studying, which is sugar and bi the biology of nutrition. But it was, uh, it was a sort of a circuitous route that I got there. Basically, I followed my research, which took me from one to another to another. And eventually, I ended up studying high blood pressure and diabetes and then obesity. And for the last maybe 15, 20 years, I've been studying sugar. Yeah, that's an interesting background. And I know that nephrology is a pretty specific specialization where it's beyond sort of the standard internal medicine residency. That's a couple of years program on top of that. So definitely uh, a lot of education to get that specific title. One of the more popular folks talking about metabolism is also a fellow nephrologist, Dr. Jason Fung, who also has a background there. And I think his journey was equally circuitous in the, in the sense that he almost got tired of treating the end symptoms of what he thought was kind of the root cause of insulin and, and all the things in terms of carbohydrate and metabolism. So it sounds like he had a very similar realization going back in terms of finding the primal root causes of some of the things that you might be seeing down the line when it's reaching you as a nephrologist. Is, is, would that be accurate? Pretty accurate. I, I mean, I, I went through a variety of steps to get to sugar. I don't know if I, I should bore you with all that at this point, but for the last 20 years or so, I've been studying uh, sugar and fructose and how it works, how it causes obesity. And our, our studies have taken us out of the kidney, not only in laboratory animals, but studies in humans and studies in uh, wildlife and nature. And so we've, we've really extended our work. We've also done studies that go back in time, uh, looking at early humans and how they handled sugar as well. So it's, it's a pretty wide scope that I've been working on. Okay, yeah. So let's dive into it. Let's dive into the work. So I would say that most of our community are attuned to the notion that refined carbohydrate, refined sugars, probably not great for us. But I think there deserves more discussion around specific forms of sugar, dextrose, sucrose, and then fructose. These are all, I think, terms that people vaguely understand that maybe in some fruits, there's more of a fructose versus a dextrose. And in more refined products, more of that pure glucose versus other forms of sugars or starches. Um, can you walk us through the high level definitions in terms of some of these categories and definitions and terms, and then unpack some of the physiology behind how these impact metabolism? Sure. So there's two major sweeteners in the diet. One is table sugar, which is sucrose. And the other is this high fructose corn syrup or HFCS. And those are the, they make up by far the majority of the added sweeteners that we, that we ingest. Sucrose it, or table sugar is actually two sugars bound together. One is glucose. You know, blood glucose is our main uh, carbohydrate nutrient the body uses and fructose. And so glucose and fructose are bound together to make sucrose. High fructose corn syrup is derived from corn and they make a syrup that has a mixture of fructose and glucose in it. So the sugars are not bound, they're free and they're mixed together. And fructose is what really makes a food taste sweet or sugar taste sweet. It's the, it's the sweeter of the two sugars 
of glucose and fructose. Our work, you know, we, we were very interested in what was causing uh, high blood pressure. And we had discovered that there was a substance uh, called uric acid that when it's elevated in a person's blood, it actually predicts the development of high blood pressure. And when we did studies, we found that it had a role in high blood pressure. Uric acid is also high in people with metabolic syndrome and, uh, and obesity. And so we were wondering what might be the reason people might have a high uric acid. And, the, and obesity had been rising over the last 100 years, as had uric acid levels. But the classic thought is that red meats cause make uric acid levels go up. But red meat intake had been going down during that time. But one thing that had been going up is sugar. And it's known that sugar can raise uric acid. And sugar has this fructose component, and it's the fructose component that raises uric acid. And what we did is we gave fructose to animals, and they became rapidly obese, developed metabolic syndrome, diabetes, high blood pressure. And when we lowered the uric acid, we actually could improve the blood pressure like we had predicted. But what we didn't predict was that we were going to have effects on the rest of the metabolic syndrome, like the the insulin resistance improved. There was less weight gain and uh, there was an improvement in fatty liver. And that was a surprise. So that made me want to study the role of uric acid and in and, and obesity and, the, and uh, the role of uric acid with fructose. And when we were studying fructose, you know, fructose raises uric acid and it's the only sugar that does so. And it does so through a very special way. It knocks down the energy in the cell. It's the only nutrient that knocks energy down. And when it does that, the uric acid is formed. And when the energy goes down, that triggers kind of a mayday or an alarm signal that tells the animal that it's hungry, that it's thirsty, that it wants to put on fat. And so the fructose is very unique in, in stimulating food intake and stimulating uh, hunger. Sorry to interject. I was going to ask just to, is this AMPK? Which pathway is fructose actually reducing ener- like the energy sensitivities uh, mechanisms? Well, we, we identified this pathway and it, it does involve the inhibition of AMPK, you know, AMP activated protein kinase. Um, but, and, and so that's involved in diabetes and obesity that is inhibited and turned out that this turns out to be a very strong mechanism for knocking that down, but it also activates other pathways. And uh, one of them is a thing called AMP deaminase, for example. And we showed that that sort of was a switch. And then when that was activated, AMPK got turned down and the animal started developing obesity, fatty liver, prediabetes, and so forth. So we, it looked like a sort of a switch. And then we realized that fructose was activating this switch to make animals fat. And we realized, and we did studies in hibernating bears and squirrels and a variety of species to show that this switch was actually involved in how animals put on weight. And fructose is, is, your, is a key way you can do that. And so, for example, bears will eat like 10,000 grapes in a day in the fall to, to uh, give them a big fructose load. And they love honey. It's really true. They do. And they, they eat a lot of fruit in the fall to help them make this transition where they start eating more and gaining fat. And so we, we realized that this was a mechanism of survival that animals use in the wild. And they use, they use it by eating fruits and honey, and they tend to eat lots of fruit. Uh, we eat fruit and fruit is healthy for us because we're only eating small amounts of fruit and they're usually le- more tart and have less sugar content than the ripe fruit that these animals are eating. So anyway, so when we realized that fructose was activating the switch through this energy pathway, we started studying it in more detail and we, we started knocking out and, and blocking the different parts of the pathway to prove that we were we're on to, to this mechanism. And what we realized is that this, this pathway, which was a survival pathway uh, for most animals, is actively turned on in a lot of people because we're eating so much sugar. And in 1700, we were only eating four pounds of sugar a year. In 1800, we were eating about 18 pounds of sugar a year. 
And now we're eating about 150 pounds of sugar a year. So we're overactivating the survival path. In the last you know, few years, we've identified that overactivation of this pathway is causing much more than just obesity. It turns out that if we studied the survival pathway, fructose activates a pathway that makes animals try to get f- search for food. It's, it induces a foraging behavior. So when you eat fructose, you, there's a period of hyperexcitability where the animal moves around more looking like looking for food. And it it's, involves novelty seeking. So there's actually a neurological impact of fructose. Yes. It, it involves going into areas where they don't normally don't feel comfortable, searching for food, novelty seeking, a low attention span because they have to look around all the time. They can't focus. And we've now linked that with the development of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and also air syndrome. ADHD, we've also uh, linked it with bipolar disease, uh, aggressive behavior, and so forth. And in addition to that, we uh, have have discovered that this survival pathway knocks down the mitochondria and increases a thing called glycolysis. And what this means is that the normally you can make energy through mitochondria, which is oxygen dependent, and you can also make energy without oxygen through a process called glycolysis. And normally we live off our mitochondrial energy. The mitochondria make a lot more energy or ATP than, and and that drives our biology. But what happens is in this setting, when you eat fructose, it knocks down the mitochondrial energy and increases the glycolysis. And it's been shown now that animals will start making fructose. Can you describe the preference shifting from aerobic respiration towards glycolysis? That's interesting. So is there something within the the coenzyme ratios within the Krebs cycle that's pushing towards glycolysis or is it inhibiting, you know, some of the uh, pre- the enzymes or the, the shuttling mechanisms? What's exactly going on there in terms of changing? It inhibits an enzyme called aconitase, which is involved in the Krebs cycle, as well as uh, a fatty acid oxidation is inhibited, a mito- uh, which is uh, an enzyme called enol-CoA hydratase. I don't know if you want to hear all this. But basically, it shifts the oxygen needs down. So like uh, if you're a naked mole rat and you burrow deep in in Africa and you're in these burrows where there's like no oxygen, the animals will switch to making fructose because it can allow them to survive down there because it suppresses their needs for oxygen. And uh, what we've discovered and others have discovered- Fascinating. So there's a mechanism to endogenously produce fructose? Oh yeah, I'll talk about that. Okay, interesting. Just like there's an endogenous process to make ketones from ketosis. Yeah, yeah, let me finish this thing first. So it turns out that in the low oxygen state, it's a survival mechanism, right? But guess what? Cancer cells are living in a low oxygen state. When they metastasize, they initially don't have blood supply. And they, they're often in, in the centers of the tumors as well, there's, there's often very little oxygen. So it turns out that tumor cells prefer fructose as a nutrient because it helps them survive the low oxygen environment. So recently it's been shown that high fructose corn syrup can actually stimulate certain types of cancer growth. And there's, uh, we just published a paper showing that this fructose pathway, which was meant to be a survival mechanism, for low oxygen states, when you eat a lot of it, it actually increases the risk for cancer. So it's not just driving obesity and diabetes, but it's, it's driving these other diseases. And we've also recently linked it with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so a lot of modern diseases can be linked to fructose. But as you say, there, you know, the issue is, well, is it just from the f- fructose we're eating? Well, we're eating a lot of sugar, 15% of our diet is sugar or high fructose corn syrup. And some people are eating 25% of their diet as sugar. But I got bad news. The bad news is that uh, the body can also make fructose. And our group were, was one of the very first ones to show this, that it can make a lot of fructose. And you know what it makes it from? It makes it from two main food items. One is high glycemic carbs. So p- you know, potatoes, for example, do not have a lot of fructose. It's really glucose. But if it, when you give glucose to an animal, it will also get fat. 
It isn't just the fructose, but if you give glucose to an animal, it will also get fat. We did the experiment and they will also get diabetic and they will also become develop fatty liver and they'll get all those things. But it, it turns out that the mechanism is not because it stimulates insulin, which is a classic hypothesis that's out there. It turned out that it, it converts, some of the glucose is converted to fructose. And that's the mechanism by which high glycemic carbs cause diabetes and fatty liver. Because when we blocked the fructose metabolism with a, using a, a, you know, a knockout strategy, when we block fructose metabolism, animals can eat all the glucose they want, but they don't get fatty liver. They don't get diabetic. They do get mild weight gain, but not a lot. And so it turns out that high glycemic carbs, even carbs that do not uh, contain fructose, can cause obesity, ironically, by making fructose. Yeah, and, that, and that's why potatoes, bread, rice, chips, these, big, these are the big four. They get converted to sugar in your body, to fructose in your body. And when you drink a soft drink, you're getting the high fructose corn syrup has the fructose in it, but it also has the glucose in it. And the glucose is being converted to fructose. And the glucose also facilitates fructose absorption. So it's a double whammy. There's another food that also stimulates fructose production that we published a couple of years ago now. And that is a food that has no calories, but it, it is dangerous. And that's salt. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy about salt. I've studied salt a lot in my career, and I can tell you that a high salt diet in a, pre in a, in a predisposed animal will cause hypertension. And it does, it is associated with changes in the body. But what's really interesting, and which has only been recognized the last few years, is that a high salt diet predicts the development of obesity. A high salt diet predicts the development of fatty liver. A high salt diet predicts the development of diabetes, independent of sugar. And we, we actually showed this in the Japanese population, but it's been shown in Europe, in many studies now in Europe and other that, that a high salt diet predisposes animals and humans to developing these conditions. And in fact, if you put a person on a high salt diet. Are these retrospective observational studies or are these interventional studies? Some are epidemiologic, but there's a study where they gave, put, gave people a high salt diet and within one week they were insulin resistant. So there's also interventional data. What we did is we put animals on a high salt diet and we found that, uh, and, and we controlled food intake and everything. And we found that they converted, they made, that the high salt diet stimulated the production of fructose in their body. It took a lot longer. You know, if you put an animal on sugar, they get, a, they get fat in about two to three months. The first month, they don't. Even the second month, it's just a little bit. But then they start gaining weight. And by the third month, they're, they're overweight. But if you put an animal on a high salt diet, it takes five months. It's even longer but they get really fat, they get diabetic, they get fatty liver, and it's because they're making fructose in their body. And when you block the fructose, you block the obesity, you block the diabetes, you block the fatty liver. So I wanted to hit on the, the, the salt question because, and I'm curious to get your thoughts here, where it's fairly common within the fasting or keto community to say, hey, as you reduce your carbohydrate load, your insulin goes down, and as you have lower insulin, uh, you uh, urinate out and excrete out more sodium. So it is okay if some, sometimes beneficial to have more electrolytes or sodium in your diet. That is a popular recommendation within, I guess, the community in terms of how to be keto adapt more quickly or what to troubleshoot with in terms of just supplementing with more sodium or electrolytes. So what you're stating is that, but if you overdo it, it might actually mediate and increase the production of endogenous fructose, which is counteractive to a lot of the rationale of why people enter a ketogenic diet in the first place. So is that, is that, is that correct? And what is the mechanism exactly? Yeah, yeah. So, but there's actually a twist to it that I'll, I'll tell you that's kind of an interesting twist. 
So uh, the, the first thing is that when a person goes on a low-carb diet, you're burning glycogen initially. So carbohydrates are preferentially turned into glycogen and stored in your liver, muscle, and other places. And, and you also have fat that you've stored. And when you go on a low-carb diet, or if you fast, you will have to burn that glycogen to help maintain the glucose in your blood. And when they do that, the, the glycogen, when you burn glycogen, it releases water. And so you have a diuresis or you start urinating more in the first few days because you, of the increased water release that's occurring while you're burning the glycogen. That also contains some salt. So there is some sodium loss as well, but it's actually a lot of it is water. When the glycogen is, is burned up, the primary source for energy becomes the fat. And so the fat starts to get burned. And when you oxidize or burn fat, you also generate water. It's called metabolic water. And when an animal burns fat, they actually produce water. Animals in the desert actually purposely become fat so that they can provide themselves that water when they are burning the fat. So the camel, for example, has the hump is fat and it has the hump because it doesn't want to have the fat on its body because of the heat. That would cause more insulation. So it puts the fat in a ball on the top of its back. And then uh, when it gets dehydrated, it will burn the fat as a source of water. The whale, whales are the fattest animals in the world, but they don't drink water, they, or salt water, I should say. They don't drink the seawater. So the way they get their water is from the food they eat and by burning the fat. And they get about a third of their water from the fat that they burn. So fat turns out to be a source of water, and glycogen is too. When you go on a low carb diet, your water, you start excreting water and salt. But here's the real twist for you, Jeff. And we have a paper in press on this. It turns out that one of the reasons that high salt diet makes fructose is because a high salt diet is dehydrating. And when you get dehydrated, you want to make fat. And the reason is, is because the body wants water. And, and dehydration stimulates fructose production. Fructose production uh, stimulates fat production. Fat production provides a source of water. And what we recently did is we discovered that a hormone that is involved in dehydration called vasopressin is actually involved in fat production. And vasopressin levels are high in people who are overweight. And if you drink water and suppress the vasopressin, you block some of the effects of fructose. And in fact, we were able in our animals to treat, to prevent and reverse obesity by increasing water intake. Now that doesn't mean that people should go out and drink gallons of water because you can become water intoxicated. So, but the old, women, the old uh, adage that you should drink six to eight glasses of water a day, the old wives' tale that we always laughed at, it's true. <laughs> You've got it's a good move to drink six to eight glasses of water a day. And uh, when you're when you are on a low carb diet, you want to drink water and you want to and, and if you do eat salt, you want to drink relatively more water than salt because you want to keep your salt concentration in your blood on the lower end. Because if, if you eat more salt, then you activate this process to stimulate fat. So here's a twist. If you go to uh, uh, out to eat and they put pretzels in front of you and you just want to eat some of them, drink water first so that, you, uh, that your serum salt concentrations go down and then you can eat the pretzel and you won't get the effect. Whereas if you eat the pretzel to become thirsty and then drink, you've already activated the process for fat accumulation. That is fascinating. And I think you're saying that that's why something like chips, which is high salt, high carbohydrate is especially bad because you get that one, two punch of a lot of glucose. It's converted to fructose as well as a salt intake, which triggers the fructose uh, creation as well, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, what you're saying is pretty 
novel in the sense that if you think about one, just within the low carbohydrate community, the nexus always seems to revolve around insulin. And what it sounds like your body of work is really describing that insulin is an important player, but it really feels like your, your claim or, or your argument is that fructose is really the central mechanism. Is that, is that overstating your claim or direction? No, no, it's, it's absolutely true. So if you give glucose, it will stimulate insulin. But, you, uh, but if you block the fructose pathway, you won't get fat. I mean, you can get a slight weight gain, but very minimal. And you won't get fatty liver. You won't get diabetes. It's not from stimulating insulin. Insulin a, is a good guy, right? Yeah, it depends on the dose, right? Everything depends on the dose, yes. Insulin resistance is the bad guy. Okay, so and that's what fructose does. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So, how does fructose play into the insulin resistance story? I mean, it sounds like we have oh, we're starting to absolutely drives it. So, yeah, l- l- we'll love to unpack that aspect. So, the typical argument around how insulin resistance forms is that as you have more and more carbohydrate intake, your ability builds a tolerance, so you need more and more insulin produced to build to have the same insulin response to said bolus of carbohydrate introduced in the system. Oftentimes, people don't really talk about this notion of fructose. Fructose is not a part of that story in the conventional low-carb discussion. So please educate us. How does fructose mediate this? So uh, fructose, remember, causes mitochondrial oxidative stress. And that cup um, has been linked as a mechanism to cause insulin resistance. It's sort of a complicated pathway that involves AKT and other signaling molecules. And it's not been my primary interest. But also, uh, when fruit, you eat fructose, you produce uric acid, and that inhibits AMP activated kinase. And so that also causes an insulin resistance, basically. So when we give fructose, we gave sugar to animals. Initially, it causes this insulin resistance with a rise in insulin levels. Basically, the, it's, it, again, it's like a survival mechanism. What in, in animals in the wild, they'll develop insulin resistance as well and, the, and, the, and w- from sugar, from fructose. And the, w- what it does is, you know, when there's not enough food available, if they're afraid of starvation, they find that, you know, that, that you will induce insulin resistance as a mechanism to help preserve the glucose for the brain because the muscles are sensitive to insulin, but the brain has a lot of areas in the brain are not. So that when you become resistant to insulin, the muscles take up less sugar or less glucose and there's more glucose available for the brain. So it starts off as a survival mechanism. But chronically, insulin resistance is not a good thing and it can lead to diabetes, as you know. So when we gave fructose to animals, we found that they initially the insulin levels go up because they become insulin resistant. But eventually, over time, the insulin levels start to fall as the islets started to get damaged. And we actually could show that the islets get injured as well. And, and in type 2 diabetes, you, you begin with an insulin resistance, but eventually they, they used to call it islet exhaustion, but it's actually low-grade injury going on in the, in the islets of the pancreas. And so there's a, eventually insulin levels fall. And when the insulin levels can't control the blood sugar because of the insulin resistance, you know, initially the insulin levels go up to help counter the resistance of the tissues to insulin. And then eventually that you're not making enough insulin to do that. And then you become diabetic. I I have long argued that it's not the insulin that's the problem. It's the insulin resistance. Fructose causes insulin resistance and glucose does not. But the phenomenon when you're on a low carb diet, you're reducing both glucose and fructose, of course. And, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful diet, but it's working primarily by 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 blocking the fructose, you know, that you're either going to make or that you are eating. So we get the we get the same place. It's just that the problem was that no one really understood that the glucose was being converted to fructose, and we we had a paper in Nature Communications that that proved that. And so it was a you know highly reviewed, you know, it was peer reviewed and. Took a while to get the paper in because of the, 
of the fact that it sort of challenged the dogma. Yeah, no, I mean, it's pretty paradigm breaking and I think it's pretty interesting. So two follow-up questions here. So as you mentioned, the intervention of a low carb diet essentially works on either pathway in the sense that if you're eating low carb diet, you're not having the glucose convert into fructose anyways. So it's almost, it works regardless of what the underlying mechanism is. So the natural follow-up question is, what are then the edge cases where the original paradigm of overexposure to insulin through just glucose, is there an edge case where that, that fruco- fructose being the main mediator changes the prescription? Basically, when do these two explanations diverge in, in, in a hypothesis to test? Yeah, I mean, so the complicated thing is like clinical trials are going to be hard because, you know, they'll say, well, we're going to give this group sugar and we're going to give this group high glycemic carbs that don't contain sugar. But actually, they don't. what they don't understand is that the high glycemic carbs get converted to fructose in the body. So these kinds of studies can fail. And so uh, the real proof is going to come out. Currently, Pfizer and some other companies are making inhibitors of fructose. And, and to be fully parent, I also have a small company that I started based upon the science that we discovered, we discovered a specific enzyme in fructose metabolism that when we blocked it, we could block the development of obesity and diabetes and fatty liver and high blood pressure and a variety of things in response to not just sugar and not just fructose, but also like uh, from glucose and high salt. So we think that this is a very important pathway and Pfizer has a drug that's now in phase three trials that is going to target this pathway. So once we have a specific way of blocking fructose metabolism, it will be very easy to show that these pathways of these dietary pathways that lead to obesity involve fructose. But until we have those, that drug, it will be a little bit hard because regular diet studies can, can get around it. You, you know, can't can't distinguish this. Right. It's conflated, right? They, yeah, they end up going down the same pathway. So that, that's a fascinating. I'm excited to see the results there because it is pretty fundamental physiology in terms of just changing how we think. And, and, and I think it's a very plausible, compelling hypothesis. And it, it makes sense in a lot of ways where the biggest killers of humans for a long time and a lot of animals are, is famine. So this notion of having a metabolic switch mediated through fructose to hibernate, to pack on, to to develop insulin resistance for a purpose, to build up fat adipose storage is an elegant solution. So it's just, and and, then the question is like now, I think with a lot of things in modernity, over exploitation of a survival mechanism ends up giving us chronic disease. And I think that it's happening with obesity is like obviously the obvious one, but so many things. Yeah, and, and we've actually done even something more than this. Um, so it turns out, you know, that uric acid is involved in this pathway and uric acid is generated. And it turns out it's the uric acid inside the cell that, that drives these effects. And uric acid is produced inside the cell when you eat fructose. And we w- were aware that there was a mutation in humans that occurred millions of years ago where we Get a very, we have a much higher uric acid than most other mammals. I became interested in that because probably of my archaeology background. And it turned out that that mutation occurred in the mid, middle of the Miocene. The Miocene was a period of time about 15, 20 million years ago. So I became interested in what, why that mutation occurred. Because the mutation didn't just occur in our ancestors, but also in the ancestors of the lesser apes, the gibbons and the in the siamungs and these other animals. There were parallel mutations and they occurred at the same time. So I ended up collaborating with uh, Peter Andrews, who's an anthropologist, paleontologist at the British Museum, the Natural History Museum in London. And uh, he's a world expert on that period. And it turned out that our ancestors back then were eating fruit. They were living in Africa. These were the earliest apes. So they were the ancestors, not only of humans, but also of the great apes. Around 20 million years ago, they they basically appeared and they were very successful. They were tropical rainforests. It was great. Uh, They lived in the trees. By 17 million years ago, there were 30 species of ape. I mean, today there's only 
four or five species, right? And then there was a change in climate and global cooling, not global warming. And uh, the sea levels fell and Africa, which had been separated from Europe, oh, suddenly there was a land bridge and apes came into Europe and into Asia Minor. And there, the, there were also tropical woodlands where there was fruit all year round. And then as global cooling continued, uh, the forest began to change to more of a deciduous forest with uh, grasslands, uh, open savannas. And the animals had to literally couldn't eat fruit all year round. It, was, it started cooling down in the cooler months. There was no fruit available. There were mass starvation. And you can find uh, in the fossils evidence of starvation in their bones and teeth. Eventually, all the apes in Europe went extinct. But uh, we know from the fossil record that some of the apes in Europe actually returned to Africa to become our ancestors. And we also know from the genetic literature that there was a massive uh, a number of mutations that occurred during this stressful period. And one of them was uricase. And what we then we showed is we actually resurrected that old gene through a very sophisticated way with a guy named Steve Benner and Eric Gaucher. And they resurrected the ancient gene from a, you know, Kenya Pithecus or one of these. But, you know, it was done through uh, a computer system, not actually from the fossil itself. And we were able to show that, that when we had the, that gene, that we made a certain amount of fat from the sugar, from the fruit, fructose. But when you knocked it out, we could make a lot more fat. And so what happened was these apes were starving. And in the, during the cooler months, they were dying of starvation. But this mutation occurred that was so strong that it took over the whole population because it provided a survival mechanism. Because when they ate the same amount of fruit, they got a lot more fat and made us sensitive to fructose. And today we still carry that mutation. And we are, if you give sugar to a mouse, you have to give a lot of sugar to make it fat, like a 50% of the diet. But if you give sugar to a human, 20%, 15% of the diet, that's enough. So we are sensitive to sugar because of a mutation that occurred to help us survive. Now, I won't go into it because we haven't published it yet, but we identified another mutation in our ancestors that also did this around 60 million years ago, turns out at the time of the dinosaur extinction. And we survived because of that mutation. And uh, we've just published, or we're, we're going to publish a paper coming up. It's in press um, showing that during the Ice Age, there, are the, there was a time when we were starving then in Europe, the population fell by 50, 60 percent because of the advancing glaciers and the loss of the mammoth and, you know, other big species that we were hunting. And there was starvation then. And you know what, what the early Paleolithic people were doing? They started making figurines of overweight women because it was a symbol of fertility. Because if you could carry enough fat, you could carry a baby th through pregnancy and, and um, breastfeeding, even if there wasn't food around. So it, it's really interesting. We, we, we came out of the whole history of trying to survive famine. And now we may, we may go back into it at some point. But right now, you know, when I, when I get, when I, well, I think of famine when I can't find a beer in the refrigerator. But anyway. I, I think it's fascinating that you're tying together the anthropological, the, the evolutionary history of humanity with biochemical meta met metabolomics, right? Like, it's a very cool integration of science. Like, very few people can cross that many domains. So, I think it's just cool to just hear in terms of how you're bridging the fossil record and evolutionary biology to, you know, aspects of coenzymes, enzymes within the metabolism, right? Like very few researchers span that kind of breadth of work. So that's one very cool. And then two, it's an elegant narrative in the sense that in a kind of an interesting, like 
I think thought experiment in terms of the times of most hardship create the most creativity in the sense of the genome finding us an adaptation to survive, right? So like that kind of evolution or that DNA flux is kind of like fo forced by having adaptation forced upon the, 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 the sample, which is an interesting observation there. Projecting forward then, so it sounds like if one were to really take advantage of this fructose hypothesis, it sounds like if one were to really want to, for some reason, want to hibernate and store up fat, then going towards fructose sources would be a very efficient way to build up adipose tissue in, in, in a sense that if you are looking to gain weight. But I think the second part, which is that why, why is high fructose corn syrup not banned? I mean, is it just taking time to say, hey, this is kind of like trans fats with margarine where it seemed like it was good and efficient and cheap and stable. And now we're realizing that this is like uniquely exploitive towards obesity pathways that's killing our nation. Do you think that's an end goal or end result from your work? Is that part of your goal? Are you agnostic to food policy? How do you think this, how do you think this ties up? One of the things that is clear is that, you know, that these added sugars are a bad, bad thing to be eating a lot of. And one of the other things that we're doing right now is we're, we've been doing studies to look at the differences between eating sugar and drinking sugar. So sugary beverages, we, ju we just completed a study. We haven't done the full analysis. But if you drink a sugary drink, you get a very large load of sugar in a very short time. If you're thirsty and you're out on the tennis court and you have a soft drink, it can go down like that. And so you get a big dose very rapidly. And then the, the cells see the concentration. And it's the concentration of sugar that causes the drop in energy that triggers the switch. So you, you get liquid sugar is just the worst because you can get so much so quickly and it's not just the amount it's the concept it's the concentration and so liquid sugar like soft drinks sugary teas energy drinks that have a lot of sugar in it, they are the most dangerous because you it isn't just the amount it's the speed with which you drink it and so i would love to see severe taxes on liquidy liquid sugar drinks, because that is like the, the open door to obesity. If you wanted, the experiment we did was we, we gave the same amount of sugar in a liquid drink where they drank it in five minutes or they sipped it over an hour or two hours, I guess. And, and theoretically, based on our science, if you drink it, rapidly, you're going to activate the switch. But if you drink it really slowly, there may not be enough fructose to, to activate the switch significantly. And so it'll act more like a calorie. So we're going to try to show that the same dose can, can either activate or not activate the switch based upon the speed. Interesting. So, so if you're going to eat a cake, try to eat it slowly. If you eat it really fast or if you drink something fast, the concentration of sugar that hits your body is going to be higher and you're going to get the more activated switch. So eat slowly. The reason eat, eating slowly is beneficial maybe really because you're eating less sugar or eating the sugar in it slowly. And so, uh, you know, you asked about banning it. I, I, I would go after liquid drinks first. Yeah. So I think one thought experiment to piggyback of a off of that hypothesis there is that I know a lot of our community members have played around with continuous glucose monitors and have tracked the glycemic response, the glucose spike of sodas versus low starches versus a ketogenic meal. So do you have a speculation in terms of, is there some glucose threshold, say above 150 milligrams per deciliter, above 200 milligrams per deciliter that triggers that switch? Is that overly speculative? Is that the right way to think about it? Like, just do you want to minimize a spike? Because yes, if, as you're saying, if you're eating it over time, you're going to have a much more milder slope curve. Absolutely. So the spike will, what's going on in the blood, when you get a spike of glucose in the blood, you're probably getting a spike in the liver as well, right? And, and it's the spike in the liver that triggers the switch. So you're, you're indirectly 
getting that information by looking at it in the blood. The only problem is there are situations where you might get a little bit of a spike in the liver, but it, it, it's cleared by the liver enough so that you don't see a big spike in the blood. So the continuous glucose monitors are wonderful for looking for that. And you don't want to get the spike because that when you see a spike, it means you're making fructose. So if you can keep the spike down, I think that's really smart. It's a brilliant indirect way of, of trying to help reduce that. Do you have a speculation of what that threshold might be in terms of a blood, again, it's as, as you're saying, blood glucose is going to be a correlate, not causative to liver glucose load. So I, I, I don't, I, I presume there's no data on this, but do you have like a best? But it could be very important. The blood glucose could be very important to the brain. So we know that when the blood glucose levels pop up, it increases fructose in the brain. And it, we just published a paper reviewing the literature, and there's really good evidence that high fructose concentrations in the brain can maybe an underlying mechanism for Alzheimer's. I know it sounds, it sort of sounds preposterous that all these things cause so many diseases, <laughs> that one, one food item can have so many effects. But the biology is actually pretty strong. It's, it's uh, scary. In the case of Alzheimer's, they now have identified that fructose levels are high in the brain of, of, of Alzheimer's patients, as well as the kind of the biosignature or the imprint of how fructose acts. And all the, you know, for a long time, they were focused on the amyloid and the neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. But underneath that, there's an insulin resistance that's going on in the brain. And, and under that is mitochondrial dysfunction and an and a decrease in mitochondrial activity and neuroinflammation. And you can induce all these things with a fructose path, you know, through the fructose pathway. And there's evidence it's activated. And one way you can activate it in the brain is by having those glucose levels re recurrently go up that can activate it. Obviously, there are many factors involved in Alzheimer's disease. This is just one. Yeah, I think it's a popular discussion item around, can you also get around the potential insulin resistance with the brain with ketosis or ketogenic diet or exogenous ketones. So I think it sounds like you can play, use these both levers, right? Like reduce the fructose that causes some of the downstream inflammation and insulin, insulin resistance, but also use a tool of ketones, uh, ketogenic diet to then potentially have an alternate fuel substrate that does not require insulin to uh, fuel, the, fuel, the substrate, fuel the brain. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the low carb diet, as you probably know. So I mean, uh, what's next? I mean, it sounds like if, you know, you're, you're humbly just going to change how we think about obesity by, by pointing out fructose as the key mediating factor. So again, like if there's a way to just have you talk about a number, I, I don't want to put a number in your, in your mouth here, but if people are tracking their blood glucose, what do you consider a blood glucose spike, right? Because a spike for someone who's eating very, very low carb could be 110 milligrams per deciliter, or that spike could be 200 milligrams per deciliter. Do you have any insight into like what constitutes a spike? So, I mean, uh, from a physician standpoint, we often look at the hemoglobin A1C as kind of a general marker for how much you're going over the one. You know, usually we, we like to see uh, fasting glucoses, for example, under 100 ideally under 125. And when you're over 125, it's considered diabetes. When you're eating, you're, it's normal to have the glucose go up a little. And I honestly don't have a good feel for what that cutoff would be. I would call Peter Addy or one of these other people who've been studying it very intensely. But, you know, I, I obviously, well, I mean, for me, if I had to put out a number, I would probably say in the 150 range. But uh, I'm not an expert on this. Someone will teach me what it should be. Okay. That's helpful to just at least frame the numbers. Because I know that some 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 of our more biohacker types will want to be quantifying this and be, oh, I'm going to try to target, even if I have a, a little bit of a carbohydrate meal, I'm going to want to have my peak below 150, which seems reasonably sensible, just given my my experiences with looking at people's data and my own data. Yeah. What would you pick? Is that a number you might pick or...? Yeah, I think that's, uh, well, when I'm eating like just very clean ketogenic diets, right? Like I, my blood sugar is like rock solid, you know, 190, regardless of whatever I eat. Um, and then when I eat 
So I think like I've definitely seen big spikes when I'm eating like noodles, spaghetti, but you know, as long as it comes down quite quickly, I think 140, 150 is pretty reasonable in terms of what I was going to guess as, as some sort of threshold. I think it's a reasonable place to, to at least benchmark, like a, some sensible guideline for people to, if they're tracking the, the, their blood sugar. So now if fructose is like the key focus area, how do we educate more people on this? Are there foods that are non obviously high in fructose that people should be especially attuned to? I mean, we talked about some of the considerations, which is that glucose readily converts into fructose, especially in the context of high salt. Are there any particular fruits or other things that people seem that might be innocuous, but actually have higher than expected fructose? Well, agave is pretty much pure fructose. And so agave, which a lot of people say is really healthy, it probably isn't. Dried fruit is pretty much just the fructose that's left after you've gotten rid of all the nutrients, I mean, the, the vitamins and stuff. Fruit yogurts, they often say healthy, low fat, you know, but they're filled, a lot of them have syrups and sugar in it. Learning to read the labels of, for added sugar, you know, they always now require you to put how much added sugars are. Added sugars are always, almost always high fructose corn syrup or table sugar. And so um, trying to eat, foods that are low in added sugars. And then the, the big four, uh, rice, bread, chips, and potatoes, and maybe pasta a little bit. But these high glycemic carbs, they can get converted. And when the food's really salty, know that you're probably trying to make fructose from that. So drinking a lot of water when you're eating salty food is really smart. So, uh, but yeah. Right. And then I think the interesting suggestion is to front load the water ahead of the salt so you don't trigger like that thirst mechanism. That, that seems to be like a signaling mechanism. I've just, uh, I'm in the process of, of I'm going to be writing a book in the next year about this story that I shared with you today. And there's a, a lot more that I have, you know, that we didn't talk about that will be in the book. Um, and so hopefully uh, that book will come out probably. Uh, in 2000, early 2022. Okay. Well, let's stay tuned for that. And we'd love to have you back on to talk about the release of the book. Yeah, I would like that. So, I mean, not, not to say that your work isn't expansive enough, but are there future research directions that you're excited to answer? And I, uh, one of the fun questions I like to ans ask sometimes is given infinite funding, you can have a time machine, you can do whatever you're, you're God, what randomized control trial or what experiment would you run? What would be kind of the magnum opus experiment? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I do, we already kind of talked about that when the, when there's an inhibitor, it'll be a very good way of looking at the role of fructose because um, it, it would remove the issue of whether or not you're eating it or making it. If you can block it, how it works, that would be a fantastic way to prove the importance of fructose in biology. And it would help uh, separate, you know, things like glucose and the insulin theory and all that. Another area that we are studying and we expect to publish early next year is the role of umami foods. And a lot of these umami foods are kind of these savory tasting foods. Some of them look like they activate, they participate in the switch as well, this switch to, to uh, survival switch to increase fat, but they, some of them do it it looks like distal to the effect to fructose. And uh, we're in the process of, 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 of studying that right now and then figuring out what this means in terms of nutrition. But the one thing I can say is that I, I do think that it is possible to, to develop a healthy diet that can keep you young and healthy and, and help reverse some of these issues. And the low-carb diet is a very in general, a healthy diet. The Mediterranean diet is actually a good diet. And just being wise and reading the labels and understanding that foods that have a lot of sugar in them are, are bad. And if you do decide to eat birthday cake because it's your birthday, and I do, you know, just do it sparingly. You know, uh, you don't want to be eating a lot of cake uh, all the time, obviously. So, but but I do think that people like sugar and and an occasional intake is is probably something that 
people should be able to enjoy and at the same time keep themselves very healthy by following general rules. Yeah, I don't, I agree with everything you just said there in the sense that, you know, one dose of sugar is not going to kill you, exactly. right? Like we are a robust, resilient species and you, you have that survival mechanism for a reason. It just, it's just problematic when you're always jamming the hibernation mode when you're already overweight obese, right? Like that's the problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's the other thing is we are, we're actively working on what happens is uh, when, as you've been obese for a long time, if you're overweight for a long time, that's oxidative stress of the mitochondria causes a loss of the mitochondria over time. And then you kind of get locked into your weight. And so we've been investigating how to reverse that. In other words, a way to cure obesity, not just, you know, one way where we can actually cure it. And the trick is to regenerate the mitochondria. And um, we're actively studying different ways to do that. And one of the best ways is exercise and specific types of exercise. But there's also other ways to do it too. And so we're, we're exploring that as well, because I think ultimately what we want to do is not just learn how to prevent obesity or to bring down your weight, but we'd like to be able to cure the problem so that you can be like you were when you were young and you can eat relatively, you know, you have to be careful, but you, you, you won't have to kind of watch everything you're eating. Right. You're re reintroducing metabolic flexibility. I mean, I do want you to watch for liquid sugar and so forth. Right. Yeah. But if you have more mitochondria, you have more metabolic flexibility where you can handle those challenges, those glucose challenges. Absolutely. But I mean, I think that's like, even just in terms of creating new mitochondria, mitogenesis, I mean, it sounds like it's obesity is one endpoint or one indication, but it's really almost anti-aging or long. Yes, exactly. Right? Like that is one of the precursors of aging. You lose mitochondria. So the, 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 the specific challenge might be obesity, but for folks who might not have captured it, I mean, you're talking about potentially helping extend lifespan, which would be a huge, which would be a win for everyone. Yeah. Our, our animals that, uh, where we've knocked fructose metabolism out, they uh, don't get aging associated changes in their kidneys and some of their organs. They, they don't get high blood pressure with aging. Um, they're protected from a lot of aging effects. That is even in animals that are not fed any sugar. So these animals are, they're just blocking the amount of fructose they're making. And, and by blocking that, we can block some of the effects of aging. So I think that this pathway is probably very important. And uh, we've just, we have it in overdrive. So what's the downside? Is there a free lunch here? I mean, like, I think within biology, if we're going to shut down this pathway, so, so what's, so what's the potential risks or the, or the, or the devil's advocate here in terms of, Hey, we need fructose. Fructose is important for X, Y, Z. What could X, Y, Z be? Well, the, the great news is the knockout mice live normally. They stay lean and the people who have this enzyme deficiency also have normal lifespans. And uh, as far as I'm aware, no one has ever been reported with type 2 diabetes or obesity who has the enzyme deficiency. So it's become a favorite target for the pharma pharmaceutical industry. And there's now a number of large phar uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies that are in the process of making inhibitors to sugar, to fructose. I guess like that... Uh, unless there's another famine, which <laughs> crossing fingers never well, happens, then we might actually want that adaptation. Exactly. We can jam a lot of fructose and get fat. <laughs> but other than that, we might have solved that problem. So maybe deleting this pathway is not a bad, bad, bad thing now. I agree with you 100%. Thanks for taking the time to explain. Again, I think it's incredibly interesting in terms of really, I think, just defining and I would say like a new model of obesity, right? Because I think a lot of the existing theories are either the calories in calories out model or the insulin carbohydrate model. And I would argue that what you're describing is a, is a third hypothesis or explanation of what we're observing centered around fructose, which is super fascinating. And I want to see all these theories compete out and whatever explanation describes all of that we're observing that one should win, right? Like as scientists, as people that look at data, I think what you're describing and what your observations 
are uh, really nicely captured with the hypothesis and framework you're putting together. So congrats on the work and hopefully we'll have you back on when some of these new papers are published and when the book comes out. So how do folks follow along on the journey? Are you on social, website? What's the best way for people to stay in touch? Well, we're, we're, I'm putting out a website page. It's going to be uh, Dr. Richard Johnson. We're going to actually launch the website in about two weeks, maybe. I do have a book that's sold through the Mercola website, the Fat Switch, which talks a little bit about this. So that would be a, a way to look for it. Uh, we, I pretty active on the YouTube. You know, there's a number of YouTube videos of me, as well as if you do a Google, you can pull some papers. And in in some of the papers I write are really aimed for the general audience, not just uh, the medical audience. But you can also find the high-powered science papers we're doing as well. And then you could email me uh, if you have a lot of interest. You can find my, probably through PubMed, you can find my email, or I can leave it with you, Jeff, and then I can direct you to more literature and so forth. Cool. Yeah. Let's not announce it online so you don't get too much spam, but yes, happy to, if if folks really want to dig in, I'm sure they can pull it up. So Dr. Richard Johnson, thank you so much for the time. Great to have you on. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.